really excited to jump into this series uh, called You Plus Me. And today, uh, Famous Friends is our message. We're going to be looking at some friendships in the Bible. We're going to be looking, trying to draw out some principles, some things that we can maybe apply to our lives so that we can really emphasize or enhance the most important relationships of our lives. Because what's amazing is that the friends that we have or the relationships that we have in our lives, they really do shape our futures. They create opportunities or they even close opportunities down. Friendships shape futures. I remember when, uh, on the, on your block, maybe you have this. Did you guys have the neighborhood watch on your block? Okay, in my block, Heritage Court, I was the neighborhood watch. I was six years old, and I took that job seriously. We lived off of this road called River Road, and our street was Heritage Court. And so, of course, we had to band together. You can't take on that job by yourself. You need some friends. So we recruited some guys, and we formed the River Road Posse. Oh yeah, it's intimidating. Just think like the little rascals, except like little, little rascals. You know, like, and so we would just, that was just our block. That was our neighborhood. I remember I had a big wheels. Anybody have a big wheels? Come on, somebody had it. Yeah, so I roll up the street. You have to charge that thing for like three days in order to ride it for like 10 minutes. You know, I don't know. And so I cruised up and what I noticed once is one of our neighbors, they had moved. The Shaws had moved. And so doing my diligence as the neighborhood watch of the River Road Posse, I rolled up on my big wheels. What's going on? Okay? Because I didn't like what was going on. Some new, I don't know if the house is being ransacked. I'm six. Anything's possible. You saw the Goonies. Anything is possible. So I roll up to the, to the porch, and I go, I said, no, I'm not stopping here. I picked up my big wheels. I walked up the steps to the front door. I went into the foyer of the house. And I plopped it down. I said, who are you guys? Six years old. (laughs) The neighbors were like, well, we're the Norrins. And I said, well, that's great. But this is the Shaw's house. Okay? And they're like, well, I don't know what to tell you. The Shaw's are gone. The Norrins live here now. Well, I I was frustrated because nobody had cleared that with me. Okay? Nobody told me that. How am I supposed to safely watch this neighborhood if I don't sign off on every neighbor that's coming in? Anyway, it was a ridiculous conversation. We ended up being best friends with that family. They had two sons, Evan and Kenny, and they were just rascals just like us. And so we became fast friends. We did everything together. We terrorized that neighborhood together. I mean, we had uh, friendship together. We got into trouble. We got into adventures together. We climbed trees, and later we would have our first girlfriends, and, and, and we would go on dates, and we would graduate, and then we would fight together for different things, and we would fight addiction together. We would, we would learn and grow, and then when we would get married, and we would have uh, kids, and we would all try and figure that whole thing out, like, it's amazing that one moment where a friendship was developed really turned into a, a future that was shaped. I, am, I know that I am who I am today because of my friend Evan and because of other friends in my life that have stepped into seasons that have really changed me. Friends shape futures. And even if you don't have friends, that actually shapes your future too. Some of the closest people in our lives will affect how we think, why we do the things that we do. And just like that, if we don't have key friendships in our lives, that will also shape us. So who is shaping your future? Who are the most important people? I think there's that that, uh, saying that you are sort of the sum of the five closest people that you hang out with. Who are those people? You know, in a world where it seems like friendship should be easy, we're the most connected, half the globe has the internet, and yet I think we could sort of agree that with all of this connectivity, there's sort of been a disconnection. It's easier to talk thumb to thumb than it is face to face. And so how do we have the important conversations, and and how do we encourage one another the way that maybe we used to in times past? Right now, there's a survey talking about how your average American in the last few years feels like they have less close friends. They can barely identify two close friends in their lives. 
You know, for a people that were designed for relationship, this should really concern us. So who's shaping our future? Who are those around us that are going to be speaking life or correcting us, encouraging us, and doing those kinds of things? Well, you know, what's funny about Jesus is I'm in my 30s now, and I'm 36, I got three kids, and trying to make plans and like have friends is almost impossible right now. I mean, at least it feels that way. Like, this is how I make plans with my friends. I'm like, hey, man, uh, uh, let's hang out. Oh, yeah, sounds like a great idea. How about Tuesday? Nope. Why not? Well, we got the games there and the kids, and then, uh, then they got to, you know, Mia's got to go here, and then they, they have a kid that goes there, and sometimes I just kind of, I just turn around in a circle, and I stare at a wall, and I don't know. There's just things that are happening. Okay, well, what about Thursday? Yeah, nope. Okay, well, why not? Well, because I'm off island here and then there, and then all of a sudden I say, well, why don't we just do this? Why don't we just periodically have this conversation every three months and not actually get together? Awesome, that sounds like a great idea. And that's what happens. That essentially is sort of, that's what the rhythm of life can do. It can dictate and, and can change. And if you don't put the effort out there, oh my goodness, all of a sudden you're not hanging out with anybody. Someone told me that the real miracle of Jesus wasn't that he like raised the dead or, or that he, he did these things. It was that he was a man in his 30s that managed to have 12 close adult consistent relationships in his life. I mean, for some of us, we know that struggle, man. So who are our friends? We're going to take a look at some famous friends. And the first one we're going to look at is Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. So, of course, we, maybe we're familiar with the story. Joshua and Caleb show up. And it's this moment, it's a critical moment in the history of the people because they, they were told to go check out the land flowing with milk and honey. And so they come and 12 spies go out there and they bring back all this crazy fruit, like giant, huge fruit, and, and they come back with all these stories. Guys, the land, it is exactly how God said it. It's incredible, except there's a problem. There's giants everywhere. And there's, there, there's people that we can't overcome. They have military power. We, there's no way we're going to do this. You see, it's one thing when, uh, when you come to a situation and you're discouraged about it and you have the conversation like, uh, oh, man, I don't really know how we're going to do this, guys. This is going to be kind of crazy. You ever had that one? These guys went full on, the sky is falling. Like, like, it's over, man. Game over. The giants are there. We're dead. There's no way. They caused a nationwide panic. Have you ever caused a nationwide panic? Like, have you been the one responsible for, for creating the anxious, fearful, doubtful atmosphere in your home or in your workplace? A million people now are losing their minds because 10 guys have a bad attitude about what God told them to do. But there's two dudes that are stoked, Joshua and Caleb. And we can take a look at Caleb's words. Caleb, I like my man Caleb. He tried to quiet everybody down as they stood before Moses. He said, let's go at once to take the land. We can certainly conquer it. Somebody say conquer. Come on. And then Joshua, down a little bit further, it says, if the Lord delights in us, he's going to bring us into this land. He's going to give it to us. Come on, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Don't fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Woo! Come on, that's like reminds me of like, remember the Titans, you know? Like, what is pain? French bread? Nobody remembers that? And was it fresh bread or French bread? I don't know. Whatever. Stay focused, family. Okay, come on. Okay, so, so they're like, no, dude, they are bread for us. We will consume them. This guy's full of faith. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Don't fear them. Where did they get this faith? Like, what did they have to stand on that the other ten didn't have to stand on? Well, it's because it's God said it. <laughs> it's because God had promised 
them. It's because they had waited for so long to see God's deliverance. And then what happened was he started delivering them. And then he parted Red Seas and there was fire and clouds. And they're like, guys, he brought us this far. He's not going to leave us. I want you to take a look at this scripture really quickly. Because a lot of times when I'm reading the Bible, I, I kind of circle and I, I highlight and I study with logos. And they have some really great resources. And so if you're ever like, wow, man, Pat's super smart. Uh, no, it's this, okay? And so, so we're reading this, right? There's Joshua's words. If the Lord's delights in us, the Lord is with us. And then there's Caleb's words in 1330. But Caleb quieted everybody. We can do it. And why? Well, it's because right there, which I, the land that I'm giving to the people of Israel, I am giving. If you look at the word giving right over there, it's to hand down, to set in place, to allow, and it's an absolute. It's not like I might give it to you. It's not like I'm going to play the game where I'm like, here you go, and you try and reach for it, and I'm like, ha ha, no you don't. Like, God's not playing that game with them. He's saying, I'm going to do it. Joshua and Caleb are standing on the confidence of God's word and promise to do what he said, and they're fueling that faith together. Family, fear or faith Sometimes it depends on the company you keep. Fear or faith sometimes comes down to the people we're hanging out with. Am I being encouraged? Am I being strengthened? And am I not like denying reality? No, no, there's going to be a fight coming. There's going to be a challenge that we're facing. But sometimes the difference between fear and faith is simply the company that we keep. So who are we keeping company with? Who are we uh, being with that is going to encourage us and sharpen us? I I got a friend, his name is Peter, and and Pete, he's like a prankster, and uh, we've known each other for a long time, but I I call him Pete the Cheat, (laughs) and mostly because it annoys him. (laughs) That's what you do with friends, right? I I told him, I was like, I'm going to tell my whole church that I call you Pete the Cheat, and he said, you know, I hope that when I come to Hawaii and you introduce me, people are like, you're Pete the Cheat, so please help me, Okay. At any rate, I, you know, Pete and I, we, 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 we were single together, we, we, we lived together, we, we did ministry together, we did a lot of stuff together, and then I remember uh, my life stage was changing, so was his, we were having kids and everything, and I found myself, this was right when Eli, our third one, was born, and things were just heating up, man. It was like Tara and I were so frustrated with each other, way more than we had usually been. I mean, we thought the third kid was a great idea, you know? <laughs> and, and so it was like, yeah, we kept two of them alive. We can do one more, you know? No, okay? <laughs> We're still trying to figure that out, but I remember I was so overwhelmed, and, and I'm just like talking to Pete on the phone. He's, he's just giving me grace. He's letting me complain. I'm like, I don't like what's going on, and I don't like what Tara's doing here, and I think it's unfair here. I'm just going down my list of things that are unfair for Pat. You know what I mean? You ever have that list going on? And you know, I, say, I would never tell that to my wife, because if she had her unfair list, guess who's going to lose, you know? Like, seriously? Bam! Okay. Don't even, okay? So, so I'm having this moment, and he's frustrated. He's like, dude, I'm kind of in the same place. And then we just have this, like, Joshua Caleb moment because he's like, dude, but think about this, man. Like, think of how many of our mentors at this moment bailed out. Think about how many people at this moment. This is the critical moment, man. You and I, we have all these reasons why we want to be frustrated or angry or entitled, everything. So what's the deal? And he says, what if instead of complaining, instead of being entitled, instead of, what if you just, you just, just, just shut your mouth, okay? This is what he tells me. What if we both just stop talking and we just serve our wives, man? What if we just, no matter what, like, what if we just, like, serve our kids? And I know you t- t- love you and I love you, but what if, what if we just serve them no matter what? What if we're those kind of dudes? And I was like, Pete, I don't want to be those kind of dudes. You know, like, I was like, no, man, like, I'm right here. And he's like, dude, what if in the next couple of months, you and I, once a month, we just talk and we chat and we just talk about what it looks like to serve our wives and serve our kids and serve our, our, our churches or whoever, our friends? Can we do that? And I was like, dude, let's do it. 
Let's do it. Like, it was like Joshua. He's like my Joshua. I'm his Caleb. I don't know who's who, okay? But it was like that moment where we were just sharpening each other towards faith that it can happen. Family, in one moment, 10 men with a bad report, their future was forfeited. They never saw the promised land. 40 years later, the only two that did of that generation were Joshua and Caleb. Their future was fortified in faith. Come on, family. We can do this. The next story I want to talk about are the famous friends is David and Jonathan. Man, these guys are amazing, right? David and Jonathan, they have this love for you. Do you have a friend in your life that you would give your life for? David comes off of his fresh victory with Goliath. He steps in. He's just, ah, yeah. And Saul, he's like, who is this son? Who's this guy? And David's like, ah, I'm the son of Jesse. Hey. Right? He's all fired up. You guys don't read the Bible like that? <laughs> he's all excited, right? I mean, the dude's got his enemy sword in his hand, right? He's all dirty. And all he did was chuck a rock right into his face. And he's like, Yeah. And, and, and then Saul's like, dude, you got to come into my house, man. And then he and Jonathan meet, and they become, the Bible says that, that Jonathan loves David as he loved his own soul. Do we have friendships like that anymore? Do we have friendships like that? Like, I hope we do, because I think sometimes then we take that, a scripture like that also, and I think in our, in our culture, in our time, you know, especially when we look at David and Jonathan, there is this really weird lens, and, and I don't know if it's just because we're, we're losing connectivity, or I don't know if it's because of the highly sexualized nature of our culture. We read into something that isn't there, and that friendship was marked by love for one another in the sense that you are my brother and I will die for you. I'll give everything for you. That marked their relationship. And what happened later in this, in this moment, it says this in verse uh, 3, Jonathan then strips himself of the robe that was on him, gives it to David. He gives him his armor and his sword and his bow and his belt. And then David, he goes out and he just has success everywhere. I want us to pay attention to that language really quick, the language of the royal armor. Because in one moment, David goes from, goes from having the sword of his enemy in one hand to the sword of the future kingdom of Israel in the other. Some of us could look at that and say that was a real special gift, but those clothes had meaning. Those clothes were meant for the heir to the throne of Israel. Those weren't just like your, everybody's jacket. This was like, if you have this, this means you are an heir to Saul's kingdom, to the kingdom that God was establishing for Israel. In one moment, David holds victory over his enemies and victory in his future. In one moment, he goes from shepherd boy on the outskirts of whatever town he was in to being invited right into the royal household. Family, direction flows through relationships. Direction flows through relationships. A lot of opportunities opened up for David in that moment, and some of them were difficult opportunities. Saul ended up wanting to kill him, you know, as it happens, right? Like, like, like all these things begin to open up for David because of one moment. Can you think of a moment of relationship that led to a directional change for your life? In fact, ask yourself the question, why am I here? How did I get here? Like I know you drove on H1 and you came up Luna Lilo, right? Like I know you're thinking, like I really hope Pat goes very, very long today. Because it's the Super Bowl, and I know where, the way I want to go. We're going extra long today, too, family. I'm really excited. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so, like, how did you get here, though? Because you didn't just get, like, rarely do we end up where we are because of our own master plan. I know I didn't. I was 18 in California, and my hippie pastor was like, hey, man, I want you to be a pastor. And I was like, all right, cool. He's like, I'm going to license you. Like, who licenses an 18-year-old punk kid? He does. <laughs> so that happened. 
And so then I get to, to I'm, I'm learning leadership. He's discipling me. We're growing. I'm understanding things. To, and we're doing that together. My brother's in the mix. Then I meet a guy through um, some of our church network. His name is Kurt Fuller, okay? So Fuller, he's a great guy. We go on mission trips and things like that through this whole experience. Then after I got my bachelor's, I finished my, my BA, and then I, I, I moved up to Tacoma, Washington, and I was like, I think it's time for me. I want to do my master's degree, so I'm looking at Fuller Theological Seminary. Every time, three, over the span of probably two months, three separate occasions when I would be looking on the site for fuller.edu, Kurt Fuller would call me coincidence? I don't know. It was shocking. I was like, what? And that was back in the day when your butt was still dialing people on accident. You know what I mean? I don't know if that uh, stops at this point, but like, so he would call and I'm like, what? Hey, what's up, Kurt? And it would be nothing, nothing on the phone. Accident. Okay, weird. A couple weeks later, fuller.edu, ring, ring. What? What is this guy doing? Hello? Nothing. Third time. I finally called him back. I'm like, dude, what are you messing with me for? And he's like, dude, I'm so sorry. It's just an accident. And I was like, okay, I filled out an application for Fuller. I got into the master's program. About a few months later, I get into this cohort, and here we are in Los Angeles, or in Pasadena, California, and I meet two guys, Pastor Elwin Ahu and Pastor Aaron Cordero. You guys remember Pastor Aaron Cordero? Right? Pastor Wayne's son, he pastored, he led this church, he pastored this church for like nine years, his guts, his heart, his love, oh my goodness. So I didn't know him, and guys, my hair was like down to here, and I, I just didn't belong in this environment, you know, but I was like, we're going to do this, and a couple years later, he said, hey man, I want you to come and speak at a youth camp for our youth, our junior high, high school. I said, hey man, Hawaii, woo, let's do it. And I get there, guys, this is back when Pastor Jay was leading the youth at the time. Jay had, Pastor Jay had purple hair. Yep, purple hair. It was amazing. You can ask him. That's the truth. We had an awesome time. Shortly after that, he says, Pat, would you pray about becoming part of the team? And as my wife and I prayed, we we're like, yes. And now we're here. That's crazy to me. There was no, Hawaii wasn't on my radar, but direction flows through relationships. So who are the relationships that we have by which God leads us directionally? He rarely does it in a vacuum, family. He rarely does it because we have a master plan that God's like, man, that is so impressive. Like, I couldn't even think of that. Like, whoa. Never has that ever been the case in human history that anyone's plan has impressed Jesus. Wow, man. Ne that's outside the box, bro. Never, okay? Come on. We need David and Jonathan type friendships that direct our relationships, that direct our lives. I want to look at one more, and it's Mary and Elizabeth. Mary and Elizabeth. Elizabeth hears the greeting of Mary because she's pregnant now. And, and, and here's the thing. They're friends, but they're cousins. Do you guys have like friends, like your best friend's your cousin? Anybody have like a, it's like a cousin bestie friend or it's like a frozen, right? It's like a friend cousin. Right, and that, that's the one you go to. It's like, you're, you, I mean, like your brothers almost, but your cousins. You're like, dude, I got to tell you something. And you know, and, and, or, or you're like, girl, I got, I'm going to tell you something. Woo, you don't even know. Right, so, so like they have this friendship here. And Elizabeth, whether we understand it fully in our time or not, she's struggling because she's advanced in years. She's an older lady and she has not had kids yet. And in that world, your ability to have kids as a woman, that, that, anchored the soul, that was the anchor of your sole source of identity. Just take for one moment to think about all the things that you think are the sole source of your identity. And you watch Jesus breathe into you the reality that you are a daughter before you're anything else. And so here she, this moment of her husband, like now she's pregnant, she's tripping out and this kid's got a call in his life. I mean, like her husband met God because Gabriel was there and, 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 and now he can't speak, like what is going on? And then Mary, so she's now dealing with the source of shame also because now she's pregnant but she's unwed. So she shows up because she wants to hang out with her cousin in the last stages of her pregnancy. And at this moment, this is what happens. The baby leaps in Elizabeth's womb and Elizabeth filled with the Holy Ghost. Someone say Holy Ghost. Glory to God. And, and she exclaimed with a loud cry. Now this is, 
This is important because she exclaims with a loud cry. She wasn't like, oh my God, that's so nice. <laughs> like, whoa, that is really amazing for you. Like, wow. No, she's like, what? Like she, whoa, she comes out and she says, blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. Ladies, have you told somebody lately, blessed is the fruit of your womb? <laughs> Maybe you have. I don't know. I don't know your life. You know, like whatever. Anyway, um, so blessed are you. And then what's crazy is that she knows her son has like a calling on his life. But immediately she recognizes Jesus in the womb as her Lord. One verse down, she'll say, how blessed am I, who am I, that my Lord would come and visit me? You know, and, and I, didn't, I didn't see this. My wife is the one that saw this, this um, observation and this interchange between Mary and Elizabeth a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago. She said, do you see, like, look at their response to the, to the frozen, to the friend cousin. Like, like there's not one ounce of of competition. There's not one ounce of comparison. There's not an ounce of jealousy, of suspicion. There's not one iota of like spite or whatever. In this moment, Elizabeth recognizes even the higher call and ministry of her cousin's child. And instead of getting jealous or comparing with it, she celebrates it, family. Celebrating someone else's win will never leave you at a loss. Celebrating someone else's win will never leave you at a loss. Our ability to celebrate the wins of other people. My wife was just like, that's what I'm praying for the sisters in our community. Like, I want to pray for those that, like, no competition. Like, we're just celebrating one another. We're going to cry when we need to cry together, but we're going to laugh when we need to laugh together. And I said, yes, I love you. Like, it was just a cool moment, and I just thank her because she sees things that I don't always. And, and I was like, babe, I'm going to use it, and I'm going to steal the credit. I said, I'm not going to do that, though. Like, I, I, she's got, I mean, it was just amazing, right? But sometimes we feel that way. Like, I think I heard Pastor Wayne say in a different way. He says, lighting someone else's candle will not dim your own. And I want us to ditch the crabs in the bucket mentality. We got to get out of this mentality that when someone else is winning, we have to, like, criticize it or we have to critique it or we have to judge it or whatever else we have to do because one crab in a bucket can usually get out. But the dynamic that changes is that when you get two crabs in that bucket, what happens? One's starting to get out and the other one's like, nope, yeah, wow. and then it's just back and forth. And then, and then now they're both dead because why? Because I ate them, okay? <laughs> we got to ditch the crab in the bucket mentality. I don't want to be yanking my brothers, my sisters, my children down when they're experiencing wins. I want to celebrate them. If I'm in the bucket with them, I want to push them up over the edge. I want to push them out the bucket because I know that once they're out, hopefully they're going to reach back in and pull me out. Somebody have a friend that pulled you out of a hole in your life? Were you the one that got pulled out of the hole? Were you the one that reached back because you were so grateful that someone else did the same for you? These are the kinds of friendships. These are the kinds of marriages. These are the kinds of like, like uh, ministry partnerships. Whatever we have, this is what we want, fam. I want to I be so busy celebrating how you're winning as a family that all it does is spur on my faith to have the same kind of win. That's what I want. So when I see someone winning in their parenting, I don't want to be like, oh, I can't ask for help on that. How did they do that? I want to go, how did you do it? Because I, I, I can't figure this part out. How did you do it? I want to ask for the help that I need. So what? So Somebody say, so what? Like, so what? What's the point of all of this, right? Like, we got the game, man. Just calm down. We're getting there. Carl preached the message, and so I have extra time, okay? 
Come on, Carl's been spitting some fire lately, hasn't he? Give it up for Pastor Carl right now. He's blowing my mind, man. So what? Who, who cares, basically? Like, what? Well, here's the one thing that I think, and it's going to be so practical that you're going to be annoyed. <laughs> you are. I'm going to say it, and you're going to be like, whatever, dude. Look, find true friends. Are you annoyed yet? That's it. Find true friends. It is the simplest yet most profound reality that we could have, that if you consider what you don't have in friendship now, if you could find a true friend, a Mary Elizabeth kind of friend, a Joshua Caleb kind of friend, it will change your life. It will shape your future. It will shape your future. At New Hope, we have we have something we like, we just use the language of next steps. God, when He finds us, He doesn't just leave us where He found us. He takes us on a journey, and He does that with us together. So first, we want you to know God. We want to encourage everybody, no matter where they are in their life, to engage with God, make Jesus their Lord, so they can understand the love of God that can give abundant life. The second step we want to walk people through is get connected. Getting to understand and to know one another. How can we get connected in our church and how can I serve or participate? Can you see yourself in the rhythm of our body life? I hope you can because we want you to be in it. That third one, grow deep. Someone say grow deep. And that's why we have ministries like Life Change that'll help us ask really intentional questions. That's why we have small groups. Someone say small groups. Join a small group. There's a bunch of friends there. Now, I know somebody's like, man, I don't know about that small group stuff, man. Sounds like a bunch of hippy-dippy mumbo-jumbo. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Guess what? Okay, do you want to know who's in a small group? Jesus. Checkmate. Okay? <laughs> Jesus was in a small group. Now, I know, look, look, there's a lot of reasons why sometimes we're afraid of those moments. Hey, look, if you have to take some other steps before you get to that moment, hey, we want to walk you through that, okay? We want to meet you where you are. But small groups are a way for us to connect on a friendship level, to have the conversations that we can have in a living room that we can't have in our sanctuary here on a Sunday. We got to go from the big to the small. That's how we grow. Family, I, I love preaching, but my message is, they don't change lives. They might inspire change. They might get you fired up. They might get you, but, but you know what changes lives? Is walking consistently with other people for the long haul. That's what will change your life. If somebody had their life changed, walking consistently with a friend over the long haul. Say yes, come on. That's so important. So who do I need to be spending time with? And husbands and wives, do we have friends outside of our husband or our wife? You know, that's important too. Like my wife and I were best friends, but sometimes there are conversations I need to have with Pete so that I don't say something extra dumb to my wife. I, 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 he, you know, sometimes I got to say, how did, Peter, how do you do? And then I'll go to Pastor Jay, my, my Joshua, my, my bro, Pastor Jay. Like, he just recently had a conversation. He asked me a question. I've been sitting on it all week. Like, it was so challenging, and it was so good. Then I go, and I, I go to, like, my, my, uh, my uh, uh, is it older brother or Uncle Carl, right? I'm still working on the level of what it is, okay? And then, like, I'll go, I'll go to, like, Pastor Calvin, who's, like, my spiritual uncle slash dad guy. I, you know, like, I'll go to whoever I need to go to in order to get what God is trying to tell me. Does that make sense? I'll go to a therapist. I'll go to a counselor. I'll go to someone anchored in faith that can help me ask questions that I need to ask. Why? Because I sometimes it's like it's so hard to make friends. I feel like as a guy, I totally forgot sometimes. Like, I forgot, like, it used to be so easy, family. It'd be like, oh, man, you like Ninja Turtles? I like them, too. We're best friends forever. <laughs> you know, it was like that simple. Like, oh, man, I like throwing rocks. I love throwing rocks. <laughs> Let's hang out for the rest of our lives. This sounds like a great idea. But now it's like, I'm like, I'm like hey, what's, what's going on? Hey. <laughs> How, uh, <clears throat> How's your, uh, how's your week? How's your week? It's good. 
It's good, bro. Good, dude. That's awesome. Good. It's good to know you're good. <laughs> Look, I, <laughs> some of you have had these conversations this week, okay? And look, I don't know why there's a lot of reasons why sometimes we don't know how to get there. Maybe it wasn't modeled. Maybe we feel like it's, it's a weird, vulnerable place. All of those things are real. But if we allow it, they will keep us from the most powerful, transformative friendships that God has designed us to have. Don't let our fear of being able to have a conversation keep you from one that can change your life. Don't let your fear of being known keep you from the freedom that you have in Christ when you are fully known. Is it risky? Absolutely, because we're imperfect and we're weird, but we're people, and we need Him, and we need each other. We cannot do this alone. Somebody believe that this morning? Come on. So what's your next step? Where do you need to go? If our friends shape our futures, are we letting things get in the way of our friendships that we need? What am, what am, what's getting in the way of how I live my life for Jesus in a way that will shape the way that I live out the most important relationships I have, our spouses, our family, our cousins, our children, our friends, our coworkers. Family, he's got more for us than we often settle for. And if we can tap into this you plus me, this sort of sense that we is better than I we will experience a depth of God's goodness that will change our life forever. It's because it's what he said. It's not what I said. 